Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Irene Heemskerk. I have the pleasure of welcoming you today to day two of the Green Swan Conference, a conference hosted by the People's Bank of China, the Bank for International Settlements, the Network for Greening the Financial System, and also by my home institution, the European Central Bank. During these two days, we are discussing how to transition finance to finance the transition. The need to, this, to discuss this topic has been numerously emphasized in the many reports and also re recently in the latest report of the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, the IPCC. It stated that the financial flows are a factor of three to six times lower than levels needed by 2030 to limit global warming to below two degrees. Yet, it also stated that there is a sufficient global capital and liquidity to close this investment gap. What can be, do, can be done to solve this? On this second day, we will discuss in the first panel transition plans. How does it work in practice? What are, why, why are they relevant and what's next? Subsequently, we will learn from Laura Kotzi from the International Energy Agency about the investments and innovation needed to reach net zero. Her introductory remarks will set the scene nicely for the following panel, where three experts will discuss out of first hand experience on how to harness investments for green innovation. In the final event of today, we will have the opportunity to learn from the governance of the central banks of China, Brazil, and the ECB, and also from the general manager of the BIS on what's next on the green finance agenda for central banks. This panel will be moderated by the governor of the Bank de France. But first, we will kick off today with a keynote speech, and I have the pleasure of introducing to you Klaas Knot. Klaas Knot has been the president of the Dutch Central Bank since 2011, and the Dutch Central Bank has been very active on addressing climate change. It developed the first climate stress test, explored climate-related risks for financial sector already in 2017, and was one of the first banks to look into the financial risk of biodiversity loss. Klaas Knot has also been the chair of the Financial Stability Board since December 2021. And today he will speak in that capacity with a keynote speech with the beautiful title, Propelling a Graceful Transition, the Role of the Financial System. You will hear from Klaas more about the climate agenda of the FSB and the actions needed by the financial system at large. Klaas, thank you so much for being with us today and I'm very pleased to give the floor to you. Thank you, uh, Irene, and uh, hello to everyone. Um, it's uh, appropriate uh, that we are on screen here and not on site, uh, thus leaving a somewhat smaller carbon uh, footprint also today. I must say that when I first saw the title of the conference, it made me think of the view that I have from my offices when I'm uh, overlooking the Amstel River. And on that river, of course, I frequently, frequently see swans uh, swimming which has quite a calming effect, I would say, uh, on me seeing them gliding through the glittering water. And the fact is that they make it seem all so effortless, eh? so, so graceful, so smooth. There never seems to be something urgent uh, about their movement. But I would posit that the grace that you see above the water actually conceals the effort of their feet just below the surface. And that, I think, is something to keep in mind also when yeah, we talk at this conference about the role of finance in the transition to net zero. Similar to the effort required for the swans to propel themselves, if the financial system is to play its part in the smooth and graceful transition, swift action will be required. Climate risk must be incorporated into all financial decisions, and this is a goal which will require significant changes to business practices and to policy. Now, I want to join others at this conference in stressing the increasing urgency of such action, and I want to underscore the role that the FSB will play in supporting it. But first, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has demonstrated the reality of transition risk and its relevance even over a shorter time horizon. It has triggered an intense debate about government's current and future energy policies, and it has profoundly changed the global economic and financial market backdrop. Public authorities are still overcoming residual challenges of the pandemic, 
and are now faced with rising commodity prices and inflation. Unsurprisingly, this has created pressure to deprioritize energy transition plans. In some cases, public and private sector players are taking actions that are simply inconsistent with their stated net zero ambitions. And the gap between commitment and action is growing ever wider. At the same time, and Irene already alluded to it, the risks from climate change keep rising. In February, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which we know better under the abbreviation of IPCC, published its sixth assessment uh, report, and it paints quite an alarming picture of the physical risks of climate change. The report warns of more frequent, more intense extreme weather and climate uh, events, and it warns of unavoidable climate hazards over the next two decades, even with global warming of the targeted one and a half degrees. The consequences of exceeding that target are even more dire. Together, these developments should reinforce rather than deflect from the international sustainability ambitions. As I mentioned at the start, the financial sector must play its part both to help meet net zero targets and to manage the financial risks from climate change. The two goals, of course, are closely connected. If the transition to a low carbon economy is delayed or disorderly, the global economy and financial system will face significant risks. And this was the conclusion of recent climate scenario analysis and stress tests conducted by financial authorities across various jurisdictions. By further deepening our understanding of these financial risks, we can not only protect the financial system, but also help to give greater impetus to a timely and orderly transition. The FSB's roadmap for addressing climate-related financial risks has been developed to coordinate ambitious action to assess and to address these risks. Since the launch of the roadmap in July last year, progress has been made across all four of its building blocks. Disclosures, data, vulnerabilities analysis, and regulatory and supervisory practices and tools. Allow me to briefly elaborate on these four building blocks, stressing their interdependencies. Let me start with disclosures. Work to strengthen the quality and the consistency of climate-related financial disclosures has been moving forward rapidly. The International Sustainability Standards Board has made very encouraging progress, building on the Task Force of Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, the TCFD's recommendations. The ISSB's two exposure drafts set out baseline standards for both general sustainability-related and more specific climate-related disclosures. And this marks a key milestone in the move towards establishing globally consistent, comparable, and decision-useful disclosures. The ISSB, in doing so, is taking a building block approach. And this allows countries to use its common global baseline and also be able to build on that baseline to develop national approaches to suit individual circumstances and priorities. And this will provide jurisdictions with the flexibility to be more ambitious and to go further or and faster if they wish to do so. At the same time, the common baseline will allow interoperability of approaches. Disclosures are important for investors' financial decision-making, but they also have wider financial importance. They will provide necessary information on the progress being made by firms toward the transition, which is important to investors, but also to a wider set of stakeholders. Such disclosures must provide the information needed to assess the credibility of private sector commitment and action. The second building block is data. Firm level disclosures are essential, but are not the only data that we need. We also need macro level data to help us determine which sectors of the economy are most at risk. We need government data, for example, on the policy plans to curb emissions and their effects. We need data on underlying climate risks, for instance, on the frequency and severity of extreme weather events. And finally, to fully understand the systemic perspective, we will also need data to assess the degree to which climate-related risks might be transferred, amplified, or mitigated by different financial sectors. Such data provide the raw material for the third building block of the FSB's roadmap, and that is vulnerabilities analysis. To examine vulnerabilities from a long-term, forward-looking perspective, 
it is critical to further develop scenario analysis, making use of the common NGFS climate scenarios. At the same time, we need to devise simpler indicators that can help identify the buildup of vulnerabilities. And this is a key part of the FSB's work on integrating climate-related risks into its broader financial stability surveillance framework. Improving our vulnerabilities analysis, in turn, forms the basis for the final block of our roadmap, and that is regulatory and supervisory practices and tools. Sectoral standard setters are doing important work already by developing tools in their individual sectors. The FSB's contribution is to help bind this work together by promoting consistency and effectiveness of approaches across sectors and across countries. In April, we, we issued a consultation report on supervisory and regulatory approaches to climate-related risks. And this report takes a cross-sector, cross-border perspective. It sets out high-level recommendations on regulatory and supervisory data. And here, the ISSB's firm-level disclosures provide a very good starting point that provide the basis that supervisors and regulators can build upon for the development of standardized regulatory reporting requirements. Now, a concern that we often hear from financial institutions, with good reason, I would say, is to ask authorities in different jurisdictions to standardize reporting where possible. As we put in place these new reporting requirements, we have an opportunity to ensure that they are well standardized from the start. So let's take this opportunity. Scenario analyses are currently one of the most effective supervisory tools. They promote a more sophisticated understanding of risks by financial institutions and also how these risks connect with transition risks and transition scenarios. Our consultation report encourages the expanded use of climate scenario analysis and stress tests to incorporate system-wide aspects of climate-related risks, such as indirect exposures, risk transfers, spillovers, and feedback loops. Our report introduces some early thoughts on the use of macroprudential tools, which is still at a nascent stage. It highlights the early work of jurisdictions to develop macroprudential approaches and calls for further research to be undertaken to assist as we continue our journey to develop our macroprudential policy toolbox. Our public consultation closes at the end of June and we would very much welcome your feedback by then. The final report we then intend to publish in October. Now, it is almost a year now since we published our roadmap with its wide ranging set of actions. To be more precise, coordinated actions by both public and private sector players to address climate related financial risks. And to emphasize that point, the roadmap is deliberately designed as a joint endeavor. We need to combine our efforts for an efficient and comprehensive response to climate risks in the financial system. The FSB's upcoming progress report, which will be submitted to the G20 in July, will provide a stock take of how far we have come and what the next steps should be. So let me wrap up. The swans that I see on the Amstel River the ones that have a calming, mesmerizing effect on me are, of course, not the green swans that this conference refers to. Nevertheless, they do have some important commonalities. The gracefulness of a swan obscures what happens beneath the water's surface. It conceals what it takes to propel action. It makes the heart look easy. In the same way, a graceful climate transition requires urgent action under the surface. As policymakers, we must ensure that the move to net zero is underpinned by a resilient financial system, one which can manage the challenges associated with climate change, and one which can propel the green transition forward. Members of the public may only see the outcome of such propulsion just as I only see the swan above the surface. But those who regulate and those who operate within the financial system know 
the status quo will not suffice. Significant work is re required, and I look forward to doing that work together so that we can make the graceful transition a reality. Thank you very much, and back over to you, uh, Irene. Thank you so much, Klaas, for your beautiful intervention. And I just love the, the metaphor you used for the swan, it's the gracefulness, but it's still hard work that needs to be done. In that respect, I have one question. You alluded to the international corporation, the importance of global corporation to address climate risks. Can you talk us through the role of the FSB in this context? How do you see that? How do you see your own role in this? Yeah, our role, I think, is pretty much similar to uh, all the work that we also do in other areas. Uh, it is to address, address the risks to financial stability and more broadly to promote the uh, implementation of effective regulatory and supervisory policies across the different sectors and, uh, and across border. And I think our roadmap is yet another illustration of how the FSB actually does this uh, in, in, in practice. It was a roadmap that was prepared in consultation with standard setting bodies and with other relevant bodies like the IMF, the NGFS, uh, that you know quite well. It was then agreed by the membership. It was then endorsed uh, by the G20 because political support is always important for the work uh, that we do. And it then tries to support international coordination on, on what I would say the numerous climate related initiatives uh, that are already uh, underway, for instance, uh, the relevant initiatives of the uh, standard setting bodies, the NGFS and other international organizations. It tries to bring all that work uh, together in, in one place so that we can then identify any remaining gaps, that we can limit overlap, that we can promote uh, synergies. It then tries to sketch how the FSB itself can serve as a forum for uh, discussing uh, these cross-sectoral and these systemic issues, identify the way forward. And then it brings it all together for us to provide input into what I would call the broader international agenda that takes place within the G20, the G7, and on this specific item, even the United Nations. Uh, so I think it highlights the FSB's unique convening power and it sets out in one place a, a strategic plan for the international work to address these uh, financial risks posed by uh, climate change. Thanks, yeah, so it's really a great international platform, I think, indeed, what you, you've put down there. And and also, it's a, it's a big action plan. I think you've, you've mentioned a lot of uh, elements, the four building blocks. If you look If you look at it, because we also have the urgency at hand, what tools do you think can be deployed in the immediate term to start addressing the financial risks from climate change? Well, of course, the first point, eh, and that I also mentioned in, in my address and that I want to reiterate here, is that reliable disclosures are truly foundational. Eh? I mean, we are in a huge price discovery process here in this eh, new area of risks. And I think uh, disclosures provide the basis for such pricing and then subsequently, of course, also the basis for the management of climate related financial risks, both uh, at the level of individual entities um, uh, and also for market participants to know what they have to invest in or not. So that is why I think already very early on in the process, we started with this task force on climate related disclosures. And we're now quite happy to see that we can more or less hand over this work to the ISSB, uh, and which has, I think, made very rapid uh, progress uh, in, this, uh, in this area. Now that once you have disclosures, then of course, you will have better data and hopefully then we can focus a bit more on scenario uh, analyses. And this is about the future. We don't have data, hard data on the future, but of course we can use our sort of scenario thinking and financial uh, supervisors, I would say, are already quite accustomed to scenario analysis and stress test. The NGFS, I think, has taken the leading role here when it comes to uh, understanding climate risks in a, in a forward-looking uh, way. And these scenarios will then uh, enable the examination of the economic effects uh, on, on the financial system for different future pathways, let's say, for, for climate uh, change. Now, on that, we issued a consultative report uh, at end April uh, on, on sort of the role that supervisors and regulators 
can play here and it lays out a set of, uh, of recommendation. I won't sort of go through all of them, but they focus primarily again on information needs. What sort of what needs what's the information that the institution need, but also what is the uh, information that the supervisor needs in order to uh, be able to supervise uh, these risks? What are the key metrics that should be developed and uh, and become available? And how can we also, and that's a little bit more specific, how can we come a bit more from qualitative data to quantitative uh, data? Because at the end of the day, we all know what gets measured gets managed. And if you don't measure something, then usually uh, it's also uh, more difficult to manage it. Uh, so, and in order to have a good pro progress here, fi a final point I would make is, of course, that the, the, the governance within financial institutions surrounding this data generating process, that's also something that needs to be subject to supervisory oversight. And I think also here supervisors have quite some experience in overseeing governance uh, structures surrounding data and the provision of information, et cetera. Th thanks a lot, uh, Klaas, for setting this out so clearly, really moving from disclosures to data to more measurement. I think I, I cannot agree more with you than, than saying that we need to start quantifying as much as possible as well to really see the risks that are coming to us and maybe even bring it closer to today, because I think we still have a a blind spot uh, there uh, coming up. But there, I want to thank you so much for being with us today, uh, setting out the FSB's agenda. It's been very insightful, I think, for all the listeners here today. And uh, with that, I want to thank you again. And uh, I want to announce that we have a next session coming up uh, on transition plans and their financing that will um, uh, start in uh, at 25 uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so please stay tuned, have a short break and uh, looking forward to seeing you later today. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Irene. And let me also say from my end, we can only do this together. So I can't, cannot see you physically where you are, but we can only do it together. We need all your efforts to get this challenge, uh, to overcome this challenge. But thank you very much for your attention.